Okay, so this is a class on theology. We have five different theology classes, so we call this Theology Five. And we're going to study eschatology, that means exciting eschatology, and anthropology. And don't worry, that's not biology. So we're not going to study biology, but anthropology. And that's the, that is the study of man. And so we want to look at these two great themes. And as somebody said, boy, that was fast in the first hour. So we will have to continue to move pretty quickly to cover all of this that we want to cover. There will not be a oral report for this class, but there will be uh, quizzes and things like that. So as we begin this class, let's have a prayer and let's ask the Lord's blessing on us. Hello, Brother Mondello. Hello. Good to see you tonight. Thank Glad you. you made it. And uh, may I ask Bailey if you could please open us up in prayer tonight as we begin. Father, we thank you for bringing us here together and for the great privilege of knowing who you are through your word. Thank you so much for giving us a written record of the true state of our souls and our need for you and just telling us everything we need to know in order to live a life that pleases you. Father, I pray that you would fill Pastor Matt with your spirit that through him, we would learn to seek after and hunger and thirst for righteousness. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Again, uh, thank you for coming out tonight. I know the, the weather was a little scary in the report they gave, and sometimes those kinds of weather reports could really uh, make you want to just batten down the hatches, you know, and, and get in as quickly as possible. So I hope that you, you get home safely tonight as well that everything will that you won't get blown like into the hudson river or anything like that on your, on your way home so um mondello i do have this for you and thank you for being in our class uh last semester so that's your test and your uh your certificate yeah thank you i'm going to mention that I, I, I noticed that too, but thanks. Okay, so on page two, you see the reading assignments. The reading assignments are in Charles Ryrie's Basic Theology. I like Ryrie a lot. He passed away last year. His, his study Bible is also very good. So, but this is an excellent theology, and he's very premillennial and pre-tribulational on his eschatology, which I like. And that is $25 if you need that, uh, if you need this book. Of course, we use it in all of our theology classes right now. Now, if you look on the, the class schedule, February 6th, we will not have a class. I'll be out of town that day. So there is no class, but there is a reading assignment. And you, you see most of the classes, it's like two chapters. The chapters are pretty brief, so, and we're going to do the eschatology part first. So, for example, page, uh, the chapter 78, and um, actually, you know what, you, you really do, uh, yeah, oh, chapter 77 and 78. So chapter 77 is literally two, two pages. Okay, and then chapter 78 is maybe like five pages. So it's not that much reading, but it is theology. So the thing is, sometimes you have to read it a little bit slowly. It's not like you just skim it and get it. So take your time reading it. And if you have any questions about the reading, you can always uh, bring it into class as well. Could you uh, give those uh, some notes to... Oh, okay. Okay, are there any questions about that? All right. So let's just start then. Uh, yes, oh yeah, yeah, we will have a quiz. So the other, qu the other class, we're going to have a quiz on that February 13th. So the first quiz here will be February 20th. And then it will be every other week after that. Or no, I'm sorry. So no, no, February 27th, no quiz. Probably uh, March 13th, we'll have a quiz like every three, every third week. 
And so the, t the 27th, we'd have a quiz and maybe, maybe the 17th. So there's probably going to be about four quizzes here. Can you believe somebody, I won't, I won't rat you out, whoever says, I, I'm not even sure I remember, but during, you know, in the, the, the test I said is, do you, have, do you have any comments? Somebody made a comment that we should have more quizzes. So do you want to have it every week? <laughs> the only problem with that is it would take so much time. Look at that, y'all. They're telling that he wasn't Look at that. I didn't rat the person out. I didn't rat the person out, and then you're ratting each other out. Look at that. Well, now we know who's the loyalty. The loyalty. But do, do you want more quizzes, though? Yeah. Like, yeah uh, <laughs> now I remember who said that. Did you see that? Who, who shook their head? Did you see? Oh. oh, oh. <laughs> oh now, okay. So she ratted herself out. Yeah. So I thought it was a good idea. But nobody said they wanted to memorize more verses or have more oral reports. No one, but the thing is, it does take time, you know. Honestly, you know, the thing that I least like about the Institute is grading. Oh, that is like the hardest thing for me to actually. Huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So anyway, that, that will be a schedule for this. And the good thing about the quizzes, though, really, is that they're, they're your best study tool. So the more quizzes, you'll know what will be on the final exam. And so you can focus on studying your quizzes as well as, you know, reading through your notes. But it's not like you have to go back and, and uh, learn new things. Really have to really know what's on your quizzes for the final. Okay. So eschatology. Eschatology. Eschatos is the idea of him coming again. Future things sometimes termed Chileism. When you read some books on eschatology and the millennium, the millennium was called, they were, if they believed in a thousand year millennium, they were called Chileists. So this is the study or theology of last things. What does the Bible say about the future? What does the Bible say about what's beyond this life? The intermediate state, the resurrections, the rapture, the second advent, the millennium, what about you? <laughs> you have an eschat a personal eschatology, so the idea of future events. So what should be some of the practical effects of eschatology? Do we just want to satisfy all of our curiosities? <laughs> or do we want to what? Know and love Jesus. So that's letter A. So hopefully as we study eschatology, it will cause us to love the one who's coming again. He's coming again. And so we love him for the fact that he will come and take us to himself. He, we're his bride. He's coming for us. This, uh, I, I'm not sure I even understand this verse, but Revelation 19.10. Can we all say that verse together? Just that little phrase at the bottom of your notes. It says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony, the witness, Jesus' witness and life is it breathes prophecy of future things. You know, and so what does that really mean? The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Question, was his first coming prophesied? What of his first coming was prophesied? Yeah, everything. Almost from his birth to his death to his resurrection. So the spirit of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy in his first coming. And what about his second coming? And, you know, and again, we're going to talk a lot about different views of future events. And how do we interpret the Bible in reference to these future events that have not yet happened? Well, I believe we have a basis of how to interpret his second coming by the prophecies that relate to his first coming. And they were literal. And so I am a, I do take a more literal position. That's a main reason. Anyway, we want to personally know and love Jesus. Uh, letter B is to increase our faith and confidence in Scripture. 
you know how many prophecies, for example, are in the Quran? None. <laughs> that God could prophesy, and he prophesied things that have already come to place. For example, one of the amazing prophecies is in, in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah prophesies that there was going to come a king who would allow Israel to return to the land after the years of captivity. And I, the name of the king is prophesied 150 years before he was born, Cyrus. Literally, he was born, and he was literally called Cyrus. And there was many literal prophecies like that. So, so that increases our faith and confidence in God's word. Who else can know the future like that except God? Let her see it motivates us to holy and exemplary, E-X-E-M-P-L-A-R-Y, living, exemplary living. Let's look at that verse, 1 John 2, 28. You can turn there. And um, Harry, can you please read that verse? And then Maureen, if you could read 1 John 3, verse uh, 2 and 3 after Carrie reads 1 John 2, 28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, you may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at this moment. Okay, so the admonition is as we await for his coming and we know he will come to do what? Abide, remain faithful in him, in, in that living union with him. So that when he shall appear, we don't have to cower in fear, but we can have that confidence. So this should motivate us to holy living. And First John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Maureen? Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For, he, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Okay. So that is our hope, that he will appear, and when he appears, we will be like him. And then it says, and every man that hath this hope in him. I don't think that's talking about, I mean, we have the hope in us. But I think what that's, that is saying is that we have this hope in the him is Jesus. We have this hope in Jesus that he will what? He will appear. Because we have this hope in Jesus, this should motivate us to do what? To be pure now. Because that's why he saved us. We have, we're saved to a holy calling. So this should motivate us to live holy, exemplary lives. And letter D that it, was, it should prepare us for grateful and zealous service. And Titus chapter 2, grateful and zealous service. Titus chapter 2, he talks about looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Titus chapter 2, verse 14, if you could turn to that verse. So we're looking for Christ to come. And I really do just believe that he can come at any time. We'll look more at that. And there's different views on the timing of his second coming. But I believe that the New Testament atmosphere is one where the believers are living with an expectation that he can come back today. I believe that's always been God's, the hope of God's people quite frankly, because he says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing. And then verse 14, so this is really the application now. Okay, so what should this do for me now? Verse 14, who's got that? Do you have that, Mandela? Could you read Titus yeah. 2, 14, please? Okay. Who gave himself for yeah. us that he might redeem us for every lawless deed and purity for himself, his own special people. Um, zealous for good works. Okay. So, so 
This should cause us to love him he, because he came once to give himself for us and he's coming back to make us uh, to like him, to take us with him into heaven, that, that we would be pure. And it, I, I like the King James language, actually, where it says, I like that word, peculiar people. But it means that we're his special possession. And that will make us different. That makes us different from the people of this world. So there are practical results of this. We wait for, our, for him from heaven. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. Even Jesus who delivered us from the wrath to come. So those are some of the practical effects. Now, what are the key events? And this is kind of an outline of the book, but this is, I believe, the order of events. So the first thing that I believe could happen at any time is what? The rapture. What will happen after the rapture? The judgment seat of Christ. Who's that for? That's the judgment of the believers, not the unsaved dead, the believers. That's a judgment of reward. And then, after the rapture, the tribulation will begin. Now, how, could there be a gap of time between the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation? No. Yes. The tribulation will actually begin when the Antichrist signs a peace treaty with Israel, which will begin the marking of a seven-year period of time. That is the start of the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord does not begin with the rapture, but with the start of the tribulation. We'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into those details. And then we'll look clearly, carefully at the 70th week of Daniel, which really gives us that seven, 70th week. The 70th week of Daniel is that seven-year period of tribulation. So while the, the tribulation is happening on earth, what's going on in heaven? After the judgment seat, then is the? The marriage supper of the Lamb. After seven years, the seven-year tribulation is over. Christ returns. We call that his revelation return, the glorious return. That's Revelation 19. And then that culminates the battle of Armageddon. He comes with what out of his mouth? A sword out of his mouth. He destroys and smites the nations. Then the millennial kingdom of Christ will be established on earth. A millennium means what? A thousand. a thousand years. Then is the great white throne judgment. That's the judgment of the unsaved dead. The unsaved dead. There will not be anyone saved at that great white throne judgment. Then the eternal kingdom will be ushered in with the new heaven and the new earth. So those are the key events. Now, let's look at this, the three basic approaches to eschatology. And in other words, these approaches are kind of like is the, the overview. How, how are we going to overview all of our study of future events? And we're going to really see it as either a post-millennialism, an amillennialism, or a pre-millennialism. And you say, what in the world are you talking about? Well, let's try to make some sense of this. The three basic approaches. Letter A is post-millennialism. Now, again, if you have your Ryrie, please open up, because I want you to learn how to write the word millennial <laughs> or post-millennialism. Let's not make it up. Now, a survey Oh, so I'm on page 511 in Ryrie, a survey of post-millennialism. So how do you spell millennialism, first of all? <laughs> There's two L's and two N's. Just remember it that way. So it's M-I-L-L-E-N-N-I-A-L-I-S-M. -L -L -I -I and if you put post in front of that, that's still, we're going to just make that one word. Your, your computer might not like that. You know, it might like make it seem like you're making up a word, well, whatever. Or on millennialism, you're going to put an A in front of millennialism. Or pre-millennialism, you could put a pre before. But, but the thing is with millennialism, it's got two L's, two N's. 
And there we go. Okay. So now, what is post-millennialism? That post-millennialism is the teaching that Jesus returns after the millennium. Now, again, if you go back here to the key eschatological events, millennium is down on like the sixth thing. But this is so important because of so many verses and promises related to the millennium. Because when we talk about the millennium, we're really talking about what? The rule and reign of Christ. Or what's another word that's... What did Jesus preach? What did John the Baptist preach? They preached that, what was the kingdom? They preached the kingdom. So the kingdom is a huge subject in Old and New Testament literature. And how one sees this kingdom affects a lot of how they see the Bible and how, how do we interpret it. So this is why... We're starting here on this basic approaches to eschatology. Now, post-millennialist teach, teaches that Christ comes after the millennium. So just a quick overview. Post-millennialists would say that the world becomes Christian through the evangelization of the church militant. So post-millennialists will say that Christ will return at the close of a long period of righteousness and peace. Now, millennium means what? We already said a thousand. But a post-millennialist would say it doesn't necessarily, the millennium doesn't necessarily have to be a thousand years. That could be just metaphor of a long period of time. So a post-millennialist is, is not bound to a thousand years. And we're going to see that the essence of post-millennialism and even amillennialism is a more of a allegorical or symbolic interpretation. So a thousand doesn't have to be interpreted as a thousand. So postmillennialism is often the position of, I say often the position, not always the position of the theological liberal, but they think that through social programs, Redistribution of wealth, and I will say that some post-millennialists have been very theologically liberal, even to the point of like Marxist in their economic policies. And not all, I'm not indicting all of them either. But redistribution of wealth and or social justice, as well as preaching the gospel in that blank, that there will be peace on earth. I'm sorry, that is my phone that I forgot to silence. <laughs> so we'll just have to endure it. I'm sorry, say it again. As well as... as well as preaching the gospel. So basically, post millennialism now, again, they're saying that Christ is going to come back when? After the millennium. So what's the millennium? The kingdom. Whose kingdom? Yeah. His kingdom. So they're basically saying there's going to be a kingdom without the king. <laughs> without the king. That's the next blank. There's a kingdom. Do you have a blank there? Yes. Without a king. Because he's going to come back when? After. <laughs> he's not there during the kingdom. He's going to come after. Now, to me, that makes no sense. Quite frankly, because without a king, you don't have a kingdom. The, the most important person in the kingdom is the king. Now, Ryrie says this on page 515, and you could mark this in your, just put maybe put it in your notes that I'm reading this, page 515, the second paragraph down. Ryrie says that post-millennialism of the post-World War II era Okay, so after World War II, because again, post-millennialists had this very uh, positive and confident view toward human nature and toward the work of the church, that the church is going to make the world Christian. Now, how's that work? How's that working out? <laughs> so they had a very, you know, a, a very optimistic view. But after World War I, 
which was supposed to be the end of all wars. How did that work out? Then World War II, and how many wars are we involved in even to this present day? You know, but anyway, so after World War II, post-millennialism has been more generally of the liberal variety. Because really, I think World War II did wake up a lot of post-millennialists who actually did believe the Bible and say, you know what, the church is not going to make this world a, a utopia. And uh, it's a more li liberal point of view now. The great advancements of the 20th century through man's achievements gave credibility to the concept. There were scarcely any biblical, uh, there were scarcely any biblical post-millennialists except he, and he does talk about this. This is a man, by the way, Lorraine. That is not a woman. Sorry, ladies. <laughs> but it is a man, although it sounds like a woman, but his name is Lorraine Bettner. He was a post-millennialist. And he wrote, he wrote about it and, and he references him also in quotes um, from Lorraine Bettner as what, what post-millennialism is. I would say the problems with post-millennialism is I, the Bible does not teach that Christ will return to a world that the church has Christianized. Even if you say, even in his glorious return, does Jesus Christ come back and everything is just perfect and pure? He comes back, as I mentioned earlier, with what? A sword to destroy the nations that were, that were full of war. So when he comes back, things are not Christianized. This view might sound optimistic, and, and again, I think it's more the liberal point of view, or maybe they will say, well, look at our technology, or, or we're becoming more, um, you know, this or, or, or that, uh, more enlightened, but it's certainly not a Christian enlightenment. And the technology itself does not breed necessarily salvation and true redemption of people, right? For many, it just opens up more opportunities to sin. I don't believe the Bible teaches that Jesus is going to return to a Christianized world. Jesus seemed to indicate, and I know there's, there are different ways you could take this, but you know, like when he said in Luke chapter 18, verse 8, he says, When the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? Now, how do you take that verse? When the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? Do you, do you think he's giving the sense that, oh, yes, there will be faith on the earth, or he's questioning. He's questioning. I mean, everything else is connected to a remnant, you know, so. Yeah, it, like a remnant. Yeah, so a few people, but not widespread. Because he says in that verse, nevertheless, and, and that's a parable of, of importunate prayer, of persistence, of pleading with God, not giving up, and how God is going to avenge the elect. And he says, nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Now, I heard it also, put some, somebody put that verse in a, in a sense, almost like, uh, you know, at halftime of a football game, and the, you're, you're, you're losing by seven points, and so the coach gets you know, are we going to let this team beat us? You know, it's kind of like he, maybe he's saying that to motivate us. To, I mean, it does motivate us to have faith when the Son of Man cometh. Will he find faith on the earth? Well, what does that motivate you to have? Faith when he comes. I, you know, he will from me. Even if the whole world gives up faith, I will hold on to Jesus Christ. I mean, I think there is a motivation to what Jesus is saying there. But it seems to indicate, too, in other passages even in 2 Timothy 3, what's in the last days? What is going to come? Perilous times will come. And the church came in the first century. Did, did the world become Christian through the ministry of the apostles? They killed them. So, that, yes. But that verse, when, when he's referring to when the Son of Man comes, is he referring to the, the day... The day of the Lord, or is he referring to the rapture? Well, I would say that he's talking about um, bringing about a vengeance mm -hmm. okay. and righteousness and peace. Okay. So probably it's more a reference to his glorious coming. Okay. But I think it's just a general statement as well. So it could relate to the rapture. I don't think it would be wrong to 
apply it to the rapture as well. But we, we, we kind of get this sense too, just from the Bible in that, you know, because as a dispensationalist, remember dispensation, remember the dispensations? In each dispensation, there was a command given to man. But at, what, what, what led to the end of one dispensation and almost the opening up to a new? A failure of man in that dispensation. Like God told Adam, do not eat of that tree, you know? And he ate of the tree. And so that led from the dispensation of innocence to the dispensation of conscience. So the man had, was to be ruled by his conscience. And then how did that work out? That led to the whole world becoming so corrupt. God did what? You know, he judged it. And, and then after that, that led to then God saying, whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by him shall his blood be shed. And they said, well, as a dispensation would say, that's, that's the, the essential uh, power of human government to, to be able to take a life and make that judicial decision. So that's the dispensation of human government. And so anyway, you have these dispensations to the last one. You have, we're in just dispensation of the church age. How's it going to end? I believe with the failure of, of mankind and that then the Lord will rapture us. And then even the dispensation of the millennium, the millennial kingdom, how's that going to end? Satan is going to be released <laughs> and they're going to repel against the visible rule of Christ. So each dispensation seems to end with human failure because of still sin on the earth and the devil still prowling and, ro and, and roaring to destroy and deceive. And not until he is thrown into the lake of fire and that we're, and the, 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 the indwelling sin is fully eradicated and we're like Jesus, you know, then there will be no more sin and no more failure. So anyway. It sounds hopeful and optimistic, but it's not biblical. So letter B is amillennialism. So A, of course, means none. So A, millennialism, teaches there is no literal millennium. This is a very popular view today. An overview. This view says, letter A, I'm going to be a little redundant here. This view says there will not be a literal rule of Christ upon earth, okay? This view says there will not be a literal rule of Christ upon earth. They spiritualize, and we'll talk more about this, but this is important. They spiritualize or allegorize the covenant promises God made to Abraham and David. So an all millennialist, no literal millennium, they would say Christ reigns where? In the heart of the believer in this church age. And he will not reign or rule on a literal throne in Jerusalem. Now, again, why we're saying basic approach to eschatology. If you take that as your position, you have to spiritualize away literally hundreds of scripture of scriptures so that's why this is i believe a foundational way to approach eschatology so the prophecies relating to to the kingdom of christ according to the amillennialists are spiritually being fulfilled now in either one of two ways either by the church on earth so right now the church is fulfilling the, the kingdom of Christ on earth. He's, but he's with us. He's in our heart. Or B.B. Warfield, who was a Presbyterian and a strong defender of biblical inspiration and authority. When I was in school, we read B.B. Warfield on the inspiration and authority of the Bible. So he was an amillennialist, but a strong defender of biblical inspiration. Okay, so you have strong Bible believers who are amillennialists. But nevertheless, B.B. Warfield said that, that the millennium is being fulfilled now by the saints in heaven. So he said that the kingdom is the saints in heaven now are fulfilling the kingdom promises. So the kingdom promises for the amillennialists are not literally fulfilled by... Israel. Now that's the big thing. 
And really, one of the biggest points of difference between dispensationalism, which sees a literal millennium, and a covenant theology, which is really what we're talking about here, which is no literal millennial, is what about Israel? Does God have a plan, a future program with Israel? And I'll have to say this too, you know, I'm just going to throw this out. This is recology here, okay? You take it with a grain of salt. But this is my, my, my take on it, that a millennialist, you can be politically, more politically correct. You can kind of like throw Israel under the bus, of course. <laughs> you know, but I don't believe we should throw national Israel under the bus. I'm not saying that all, everything they do is right, but I believe that, that the devil hates national Israel. Just look what Iran wants to do to them in half the Arab world. You know, so, and God does have a plan with national Israel. I do believe that very deeply. I do. But our millennialist says he do, they don't. Our millennialist says that God does not have a future program with Israel. Sorry for my redundancy, but emphasizing the point. So that's the blank there. Israel under letter D. The key to coming to this kind of interpretation is to interpret figuratively. Our millennialists teach that the promise God made to Israel, he makes to them who believe. In other words, God has no problems with promises anymore with Israel because, you know, they, they crucify Christ and they've sinned away. They've sinned away those promises and they're not for Israel any longer. And so it is now the church that inherits those promises that God made to the physical seed of Abraham. We are Israel. We are spiritual Israel. The church is spiritual Israel. And there's no plan for national Israel. Okay, so that, that's essential to amillennialism. Okay, so um, just a brief history here. And he, uh, Ryrie, on page 520, you might want to mark that in your, in your book, uh, in your notes anyway, on page 520. He gives this little history, and I'm summarizing a little bit there from what he writes. But letter A is origin, O-R-I-G-E-N, who was a heretic. A uh, uh, leader in the early uh, time of the church from 185 to 254 BC. So, what did Origen do? He stressed and popularized an allegorical, non literal method of, in, of, interpret, of interpreting the Bible. And he spiritualized the future kingdom. He was a heretic. He denied foundational doctrines of the Bible by spiritualizing them away. Then, number two, or letter B there, you have Constantine, the, the emperor Constantine I'm talking about. What did he do? He united church and state. And it appeared like the church was triumphing. Can you imagine the, the church coming out of, you know, almost 300 years of persecution? And then Constantine says, enough is enough, you know. And he Christianized the empire. Sounded like a great thing. Sound like it, it, it was like almost the church was was gonna spread, and so that gave rise to this amillennial point of view. And then Augustine is letter C. He spiritualized the concept of the kingdom. Now I'm not a big fan of Augustine, quite honestly. You could read Augustine's testimony, and he's written famous things and said things that we we would all quote. And so not everything uh, of Augustine is, is bad. I'm not saying that, but I will say that he was a, he was a Roman Catholic. He established the real fa doctrinal foundation of the Roman Catholic Church. And, 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 and he actually, he opened the door to really the, um, the inquisitions later on and the persecution. And, and for, because he did not believe you could leave the Roman Catholic Church. And if you left it, you should be brought back for even with some strong encouragement, you know, which actually led to even persecution and the inquisitions later on. So he kind of, and again, I'm not blaming him fully for it, but he opened the door for it. But anyway, I'm not a big fan of Augustine, but, uh, and I have this, many people view that Augustine is the greatest theologian from Paul to, to uh, Martin Luther, you know, and many people have a very, very high view of Augustine. I'm not, I'm not quite there on, nevertheless, Augustine popularized 
the amillennial view by teaching that the visible church is the kingdom of God upon the earth. The church is the kingdom. He said that the millennium is the time between the first and second comings of Christ. And they had all different kinds of views on this. Back then, they actually believed that it would be a thousand years. But then when it went longer, then they had to readjust their, their views. But nevertheless, he, he said that the millennium was the time. That, picture that. Christ came, went to heaven, and now is the millennium. And the church is going to establish that kingdom on the earth. And then he'll come back at the end of, of, of that and then establish the eternal state. So were there big, I don't know, anticipation going on with like the year 1000, the year 1300? That would be a good thing to Google, maybe so, you know, I don't know, maybe so. Is that the, is that the position that the Catholic Church holds because he was like the founder? Yes, yeah, so the Catholic Church is a millennium. They, they, they believe there that the Catholic Church is the kingdom on earth. A political and a religious kingdom. That's why the Pope holds up two fingers. That's why he kisses the ground. Because he does believe that he's the political and the spiritual ruler, rightfully, of the world. The Catholic Church is a political system, right? I mean, they're, they're actually viewed as a political entity by other governments as well. They, you know, we have an embassy there in the Vatican and so forth. So Augustine popularized this view, saying that the visible church is the kingdom of God, that is the church. So the church replaces Israel. Have you heard that expression? Replacement <laughs> theology. So what do we mean by that? We're saying replacement the theology says that the promises God made to Israel, he makes with them no more. They've sinned away those promises, and the church now takes those promises over. That's what the whole point of the Crusades, by the way. You know, the Crusades was to reclaim the land and set up the kingdom there as well. So Augustine was thoroughly a Romanist. Therefore, their view was that the Roman Catholic system was the kingdom of God on earth. And as I said, many view Augustine as the greatest theologian between Paul and Luther. Before Augustine, only heretics claimed amillennialism. The reformers, Martin Luther and John Calvin and so forth, adopted this Roman Catholic position. It is still popular in Reformed churches today or in covenant theology or Presbyterian churches. Most Presbyterian churches are covenant theology. Calvinists adopt John Calvin's theology. John Calvin was strongly not pre-millennium, did not believe in a literal millennial kingdom. And it's a strange irony, and I put this as a note, that the Reformation was based upon what? What did Martin Luther base the Reformation upon? A literal interpretation, sola scriptura, only scripture, you know? And, and it's by faith we're saved, we're not saved through our works. And that was based on a literal interpretation of salvation verses. But in relation to future events, they still held to figurative, allegorical interpretations. And I give them this little leeway here. I said, per perhaps the spiritual battles that Luther and the, 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 and the Reformation and Calvin and those guys were fighting centered on salvation, baptism, the Lord's Supper. And they did not fully think through the importance of a literal interpretation on future events. Okay, so some of the problems here. They spiritualize the promises God made to Abraham and David rather than take them in a literal sense. So what do I mean by that? Let, let's just, we're not, we're going to get just to the end of this section and finish, but go to Luke chapter 2, please. Luke chapter 2. No, Luke chapter 1. And verse 31 through 33. Luke chapter 1, verse 31 through 33. So we're saying that amillennialists spiritualize the promises that God made to Abraham and David. And that Jesus Christ would be the one who would fulfill those promises by his, by his coming and establishing his kingdom on earth. And sitting, and, and what would promise that God made to David? That he would, that one would sit on his throne forever. And we'll, we'll look at that. That's the Davidic covenant. So here, here it is. Here's the promise. 
Luke chapter 1, verse 31, it says, And behold, thou shalt conceive, this is Gabriel talking to Mary, in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give to him the throne of his father, David. There it is. Now, is that a literal throne? Or is it a spiritual throne? Well, Jesus came and, and left. Did he sit on that throne? Oh, not the first time. So we say he's going to come again, and he will sit on that throne. Now, we say it's literal. A millennialist would say it's not. You see, this is what I say they take an allegorical position and not a literal position, interpreting verse like that, and then verse 33. And uh, who could read that? Who could read verse 33, please? Um, who's got that? Okay, Anna? And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Okay. So... And people will say, Amalekis will say that Jesus will rule, you know, in the eternal state forever. But we also believe, and we'll, we'll look at these verses, that there has to be an earthly element to his kingdom. And that's what the millennium is. The earthly kingdom of Christ, which is the first part of his eternal rule. But he will sit on a literal throne, a throne of David, which was an earthly throne. That's what we believe. So... They take a non-literal, they employ a non-literal, literal. do you have a blank there on point three? Yes. Sir. I didn't give it to you. So that's non-literal or spiritual principle in the area of eschatology. Some of the strengths, though, that make it popular, it's a simple system. It teaches one coming, one resurrection, one coming of Christ, one judgment. And I, I, I do confess that, you know, premillennialism and pre-tribulationalism gets a little complicated because we say, you know, he's going to come back. You know, he's going to rapture the church. There's this tribulation. He's going to come back again. You know, and so there's two parts to his coming, right? So all millennials would say, no, there's, come on. You guys are just making this stuff up, you know, <laughs> two parts to his coming. No, he's just going to come back and settle everything, settle the score right there, and we go into the eternal state. So it is simple. It's a simpler system. We get a little complicated sometime in our charts. You know? <laughs> okay, it appeals to the covenant theologian who fails to clearly distinguish between Israel and the church and God's program. So that's a key point of our millennialism is it blurs the difference between Israel and the church. And just, just stop to think for a moment. Is there a difference between Israel and the church in its founding? Is Israel the church? Who's Israel? What is Israel? Jacob had what? 12 sons, and that's Israel, right? The 12 sons of Jacob, and then they, they had the 12 tribes. Now, is that the church, or is that Israel? What's the church? Is the church something different? Did Jesus not say, I will build my church? So does that, that means the church didn't exist before. Jesus said, I will build it. Jesus will build it. It didn't exist before. It's something new. How, how, the establishing of the church, what did Jesus do? He chose who? 12, 12 apostles. So Israel started with 12 sons. The church started with 12 apostles. So the founding of the church is just two different entities, two different distinct groups. But together, I believe we will be together in the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God isn't Israel. It isn't the church. It's Israel and the church. God has a plan and a program for each group distinctly. That's, see that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, Last thing here is it places great emphasis upon the visible church as, you know, fulfilling the promises God made to Israel. So the, the emphasis here is on the visible church. And so one could see where the Roman Catholic would gravitate toward this view. So we'll, we'll have to stop there. I wanted to actually get to much further, but that's the way it always seems to be. And uh, so this is the end of part one. Here we go for a new semester. Hang in there. 13 weeks or so and your final exam.